Good morning team, happy 3rd of August. I hope you've had a good few weeks so far if I haven't spoken to you since your review. Today you've got section two of your unit, understanding roles, responsibilities and relationships in education and training. And just for the record, the code for that is H5050053. We started this in our last group session and we pick up now where we're looking at legislation, we're looking at working with other professionals and we're looking at understanding the boundaries between our role and other professionals roles. In our other session we were looking at the teaching roles and responsibilities first and foremost and then we expanded it to look at the learning environment that we create and by now no doubt you'll have uploaded your essay on that so thank you very much for that. I'm going to share my screen now with you and I'm going to uh, hopefully do as much of an interactive session that I can, bearing in mind that it's a pre-record. So one of the things I'm going to do is when I deliver you a task, I'm going to ask you to press pause. What I'm not going to do is sit here for the five, ten minutes that task is just looking at the camera. Okay, so please do join along with me. It'll be easier that way and that is the way in which this resource is intended to work. I'm going to share my screen with you and um, basically work through a PowerPoint that should be very helpful to helping you with this piece of uh, work that we need to submit. So I'm hoping that you can see this now. It identifies very clearly for you that we are looking at legislation session two from the unit that I've just explained to you. The objectives for this session today are to explore the relationship between teachers and others in education, to identify what key legislations you should be aware of and to raise awareness of where to research to learn more about legislation. For this particular unit, in order so to submit your work, you can do so in a range of options and I've suggested three here. One is an interview where I will have already provided the interview questions, one an essay where the interview questions that I have provided actually become your subheadings and a mini lecture. The interview questions are what you must teach. So how should you decide to submit your work and in which format? Well, this is where you need to be self-reflective about your work as a practitioner and what you enjoy. Do you enjoy sitting in an interview and being able to discuss your thoughts? Perhaps you like to debate. Perhaps you find you're better at punctuating your points when you're talking verbally rather than when you're writing. You may find that you are able to showcase communication skills better in this format. It might be that you actually need to prove some of the functional skills of listening and writing. Perhaps instead you're someone that enjoys research and academic reading. Just to be clear, you need to research with whatever route you decide to take, but perhaps you enjoy academic reading. You're eager to use the research log that I will go through later on and some of you no doubt have already looked at. Perhaps you need to demonstrate functional skills that are to do with writing. A mini lecture is a short lesson in which you're able to divulge information quickly, easily, succinctly, perhaps using a range of resources. For example, if you were to record a mini lecture, you could use digital animations to get your point across. But it depends how I fail with technology you are, I suppose, in ICT. For all three of these, you'll need to make sure that in whatever route you take, your technology or the way in which you decide to submit the work will work for you. Technology failing you is not the route for not submitting this piece of work. So it's always a good idea to have a written plan for your mini lecture detailing the information for the questions. It's always a good idea for the interview to have the questions and then your answers. So at the very least, we could use that, but your submission needs to be in one of these formats. So where do you begin? Well, we begin with a question. And like I said, I'm going to give you those questions. And then you'll create a blank research log, which you see an example of below. So in this log, I'm going to talk you through it. First of all, we have the date. This is the date that you find a particular piece of research. So in this case, it was that date. What are you looking for in particular? So if we assume our question is to work out, in this instance, this is for an English student, to work out whether Shakespeare was 
a single playwright or a group of playwrights. So the first search objective this person has is to find out about the background of Shakespeare, very broad objective. Then they need to identify their source citations, though the originals of the origins of the source. So where did this particular piece of research come from? Then describe the research. So this particular piece of research is an article from the Guardian newspaper. You decide later if, it, if that level of source is primary or secondary and the reliability of the source. So in this instance, it's reliable as it quotes from the diary of Shakespeare himself or herself, community self, I suppose. And then what result does this particular piece of research have on your overall question? Will it have a direct impact on the final point you're trying to make? And even if you're trying to work out what that point is, this particular one, I think, would have a direct impact. So you might write in that box, um, could quote from the diary, could use as a citation, something like that. So it just helps you to keep track of the relevance of that particular piece of research. Then the important bit really is here, what's the next stage? So what, what did that piece of research leave you needing to do next? Well, the student here has written, this research has left me questioning who the female names quoted are in the diary. So I will interview the historian cited in the, and I presume the student meant to write in the um, document. And so if you, if you had to quickly rush off and do some other work elsewhere, you could come back to this document and know what you needed to do next. And it's a good pickup of where you left off. Now, I've also got up here this odd little quote here, why boy? This is a game. This is a game you might play at the beginning of your uh, research process. So if your question is, um, was Shakespeare a single person or a community driven playwriting scheme? You may sit down with somebody and say, right, ask me, ask me this question and I'm going to tell you everything I know. So you'll say, well, I know that Shakespeare existed as a single person, at least, because Shakespeare there are records of Shakespeare, a man living in, within an era. And they would say, why? Well, you would respond with, well, those um, records exist because blah, 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 blah. And they would respond with, why? And you keep going until your answers become irrelevant or you can't answer. There is nothing logical that you can come back with and there in that moment you've identified a gap in your knowledge and so you would write that in that's something you might write there in that box after a game of wide boy i realized that i do not know the answer to such and such and that then allows you to feed in your next search objective so you would write in this box here i need to know such and such which has come straight off this so it feeds in there so it's like a snake that just keeps feeding uh, significant research. I hope that makes sense. There is another resource on this as well. Then you need to actually go and find some research. So when you are finding that research, you want to be asking yourself these questions. This is going to directly inform your production log here. So you want to know who the author is because that's relevant. If it's an enemy of the, the practitioner you're writing about, is it likely that that person is going to be objective? Enemy sounds very cops and robbers, but if it's something with opposing ideas, is it going to be objective? Is the author related to the particular practitioner? Did the author write the theory that you are looking at? So you need to think about where that um, mindset is coming from for the author. Date of publication. This is important for two reasons. Number one, is it relevant now? And sometimes the older it is, the more relevant it becomes. And number two, has it been published? Has it gone through the publication route of being proofread and checked by publishers? Be mindful and wary that many websites have not gone through this process. Wiki is not necessarily a great tool for research because much of the data on there is added by whoever and it isn't well published. I mean, you hear all sorts about celebrities on Wiki having to go in and change the data on there because it's incorrect. So really, you're looking for well-established, publicised and published data to use as your sources. 
How reliable is that information? Well, you need to think about in this instance, where did it come from? If you're looking at um, an article from the Daily Mirror or the Daily Ter Telegraph, one is certainly going to be more reliable than the other. If you're relying on, um, for example, if we were looking at Shakespeare, if you're relying on Shakespeare's diary, that, that's reasonably reliable to suggest that a man called Shakespeare exist did. Um, if you're looking at um, a photograph, for example, that's reasonably reliable information, but you will come across information that is per se not reliable. And it's okay to put that in your production log because what you're then showing is you can dissect appropriate information for your submission of work. Who is the intended audience? Is it a persuasive piece of text? Therefore, in what way is it written? And that leads you to start considering what is the intention of the source? Is it propaganda? Is it educational? Is it marketing? Does it provide a balanced view? And all that will help you better understand if it meets your search objective, if it's going to be useful for your overall question. What, how relevant is the document overall to your topic? So it might be you're looking at something educational, you'll get loads of educational adverts come up, no doubt, uh, about different educational topics, etc. But do they relate specifically to what you're looking at? So all these questions need to be with you when you're filling out this source, this research log, and they need to be with you when you're picking up a piece of research, a book, an article, a podcast, uh, a seminar, anything like that. And it might be worth printing a couple of these out and scribbling all over them for each of the different um, research sources that you find. Once you've found your particular piece of research, you've asked the questions of it that we just spoke about, you've started filling out your research log, you need to think about how you're going to interact with it. So we have uh, an interactive reading strategy. Okay, and it's called SQ3Rs. The first thing you do is you survey that particular document and we're talking about reading skills here. So we are talking about texts. So you skim through the text. Skimming through the text doesn't mean reading every word. It means locating in your brain keywords that you're looking for and trying to find them quickly in the text, like you might a word search. Once you've noticed that there are those keywords in there, you know that it's probably going to be relevant in some format to what you're looking for. If you're surveying the text and you're not finding any keywords, you have to question, is this piece going to be relevant and time worthy to then read in more detail later? Once you've noticed the keywords are in there, you're going to question that text. Why am I reading this? And this relates straight to this log here. What am I going to get out of reading this piece of research. Jot down any questions that you need answering at the top of that piece of text. Then read the text carefully in small sections at a time. Don't try and read it through in one go. Take pleasure in reading through those different parts of the text. Mark it as you go, highlighting key words and underlining phrases. But remember my rule. You should not just be colouring in that page. Everything that's highlighted should be annotated, explaining why it's highlighted. For example, if you're highlighting a keyword, write KW next to it. If you're underlining a phrase, perhaps write possible citation or quote. Then go over what you've read. Pick out the main points. Check you have some answers to your initial questions. This is the point at which you might start filling in your research log for that particular piece of writing. Then review. Look back at it at a future date, which will be easy because you filled this in. So two days later, you can go back and check what you wrote in note form and reread that piece of text. Have your questions been answered and how much can you remember? Another strategy is scanning your book or your piece of text, looking for a particular piece of information. This is similar to looking at words in a dictionary where you again are not reading the whole text. Some texts will take longer to look at, and that's where you are showing extensive reading skills. You should provide a general understanding. This might come from an article or a chapter in a book. This is where you need to give yourself time to sit quietly and really absorb information. And then intensive reading is shorter text, finding specific information and actually being able to retain that, that detail. Now, in the example provided here, it's a novel for pleasure, but it might be actually that it's a blog in your instance where it's quick, it's short, there's lots of information and it's finding ways to 
attain that information and keep it in your brain. So I would expect to see a range of these in your research and you can be popping that in here so that it keeps you on top of and reflective about the kind of research you are embarking. So when you've picked your relevant pieces of research that you start to pull together um, to create an essay out of, you should be noting down the following, whether that is directly onto the research or whether you're making a note about this in your research log is up to you. So what's the text about? What type of language it is used? This will help you understand its relevance. What are the key attributes of the text, the theory or the title that I can identify? And what makes this piece interesting? And, and that is a tough question because there's two reasons. It might not be interesting to you per se because you might not read it if you weren't being ushered to read it. But is it interesting because it answers the questions you have or it opposes some of the thoughts and theories that you had already? Or is it an anomaly of a piece of text where it's something that you hadn't uh, considered or thought about before? Once you have gone away and written your research log and you've thought about perhaps that piece of research for a couple of days, you might play the why boy game of what I know based on that research. Where are the gaps in my knowledge now of my initial title question? What type of source am I looking for next to make sure that I'm using a broad range of sources of what I know? What needs further interrogation? What type of source am I looking for to fulfill that interrogation? And what is my current opinion of all the information I've read? And would I win a game of why boy, i.e. would I never get to the point of not being able to fill that gap? So then we can take it to some deeper level um, research. There are three eyes in academic research, independent learning, interrogative approach and individual viewpoint. I'm not going to read this slide to you. I'm going to give you a few minutes in a moment where you can pause the video, video and read them yourselves. But what you need to know is that independent learning in the top left as you look at it and interrogative approach in the top right as you look at it work together to create your individual viewpoint. You can't have that individual viewpoint that's balanced without the independent learning and the interrogative approach. Now's your opportunity to pause the video read through the three eyes and better understand what they mean. Of course, if you have a question, write it down. I'm always on email and hopefully can answer it for you. Pause your video now. Okay team, welcome back. So what you have here is a culmination of how you would, I would expect you to be doing your research. I call this a research snake, albeit an arrow and grid diagram. But you would start here identifying your question. And I have already identified four questions for your submission for you. So you will do this process four times over. Create your blank production log, which we've talked extensively about. Identify holes in your knowledge about the question you wish to answer. Use the materials offered to you on the course to start your research, but be careful of wiki and go beyond the course materials that you're going to see in a moment because they certainly will not be enough. Review your log, rag it regarding what is useful and what is helpful. So you've got a visual representation of the amount of research that is supportive. If when looking at that ragged research log, you find there's a lot of red on there, your research isn't going in the right direction. And you may need to ask for more support. And you can do that in a range of ways. You can come to your course tutor, i.e. me, or speak to Lisa, or you can go to the librarians, or you can speak to people online about trying to initiate a better way of researching. Identify what the next steps in your research are, and you may do that a number of times, which is why we have this block in here to continue your research log. Review all the relevant research findings and conclude them, and then decide how you're going to pre present them, whether that's in an essay, whether that's in a, an interview, or whether that's as a mini lecture. So we're all here. We're starting with question one. What are the key aspects of legislation, regulatory requirements and codes of practice relating to your own role and responsibilities? Next, what you've got to do is create a blank production log. Pause the video now and create that log. Okay team, welcome back. You should have in front of you a blank production log 
And at the very least, this single question at the top of it, it's time to start identifying holes in your knowledge. And you might do this in a range of ways. If you're working with somebody else, ask each other questions about the holes in your knowledge. If not, mind map all the things you think you know about this particular subject, and then use this grid to help you move forward in your research. What I'm going to do is I'm going to shift through the rest of the questions and then to a guide for you. Question two would be explain how the teaching role involves working with others. Again, you will start here and work through the grid as per before. Question three, explain the boundaries between the teaching role and other professional roles. And question four, describe points of referral to meet the individual needs of learners. What I recommend is in a moment when you go off to research your first question, you make sure you come back to this video so that then you can start the process again with question two, question three and question four. So let's give you some helpful prompts to get this research going. Rights and legislations. First of all, a legislation is defined by an Act of Parliament. That's something to remember and can help you when you're researching determine how relevant some of your research is. So here's some of the acts that if you haven't already looked into detail of, you need to. The Education Act and the Equality Act. I recommend you compile a list of the characteristics you think that are protected by the Equality Act. There are eight of them and the first one is age. Pause the video now and give this task a go. Welcome back team. Let's see how many of the eight you got right. You'll notice we had age at the top and the others are disability, gender reassignment, pregnancy, maternity, race, religion or belief, sex and sexual orientation. A good place to start might be to put some of these into Google and find out if you can find the original acts or more information about them. The next task I'm going to ask you to consider is why are these important? Pause the video now, copy down this form or this document or take a snapshot of it and fill it with why you think all these areas are important. Welcome back team. I'd like you to consider what policy does your institution have in place to make sure that these characteristics are protected. If you're not sure, you need to know where to look, or at least who you might ask in the first instance to guide you in the right direction. Perhaps take a moment now to note down who that might be and put a little target in place to find out what policy your institution does have. Health and Safety at Work Act. Ofsted, Special Educational Needs and Disability Code of Practice. And what's important here is some of these acts really supported a change in education across the 20th century in general. So please bear in mind the impact that these have got on your teaching now. Assessment prep, some information that you need to go and find out. When was your last offset inspection? And if you don't know this, it's certainly going to be available on your website. What was the grading? Why did your institution receive that judgment? And where could you go to find out more information? All of that, apart from point four, may be on your website. So go look it up and find out. It's nothing better than knowing more about in your institution and being able to provide some answers or at least have it inform how you improve your teaching. Then I want you to consider this question. How does your school adhere to the SEND code of practice? Pause the video now to complete these two tasks. Okay team, welcome back. Now we're looking at the Data Protection Act and this has been a big one of the past couple of years because obviously we've had a big push on GDPR. I've got an assessment task for you. Through a discussion with somebody, compile a list of what types of data that you think you would be privy to in your role. And that discussion can be with a parent, a colleague, a sister, a brother, a student. See if you can think outside the box, not just you as an individual in your role, but also what others perceive of the data that you will handle. 
pause the video now and find a friend to chat to. Hello team, welcome back. There are eight fundamental principles relating to how information is distributed and stored. What do you think they are? Pause the video now and make a list. Hello team, welcome back. Here are the eight fundamental principles relating to how information is distributed. Is this the same as what you had made in terms of a list? Or is this different? Make sure you've amended your list to ensure that all these eight are included on it. I wonder if any of these shock you. What would you do if you were in a, oh, what would you do if you were in a situation where data that you used was then lost? For example, let me give you a case study. You have a student in your class and you've written about their sensitive educational needs in your teaching planner and your teaching planner has gone missing. What are your next steps? How do you solve this issue? Pause the video now and write down some ideas of what you might do. Welcome back team. Now we're looking at DBS or CRB as you might have remembered it and professional codes of practice. Don't forget the very brief sentences here that I'm offering you is not enough research. You need to go and find more research for each of these. Assessment prep. Next, you are understanding the relationship between teachers and other professionals in education and training. If you struggle to watch this video, which no doubt you will based on the fact that this is a Zoom call that I'm turning into a video, you need to make sure that you can access this link here and I will pop it into the email for you. A funny little poem, and I'm not sure if you can read this, so I'll read it to you. I'm so much more than just a teacher. I am a counsellor and psychologist to problem-filled child. I'm a police officer that controls a child gone wild. I am a travel agent scheduling our trips for the year. I am a confidant that wipes a crying child's tear. I am a banker collecting money for a ton of different things. I'm a librarian showing adventures that a storybook brings. I'm a custodian that has to clean certain little messes. I'm a psychic that learns to know all that everybody only guesses. I'm a photographer keeping pictures of a child's yearly growth. When a mother and a father are gone for the day, I become both. I am a doctor that detects when a child is feeling sick. I'm a politician that must know the law and recognize a trick. I am a party planner for holidays to celebrate with all. I am a decorator of a room filling every wall. I am a news reporter updating on our nation's current events. I am a detective solving small mysteries and ending all suspense. I am a clown and a comedian that makes the children laugh. I am a dietitian assuring they have lunch or from mine I give them half. Where we seem to stray from values, I become a preacher, but I'm proud to say, I'm proud to have to be these people because I'm proud to say I am a teacher by Stacey Bonino. Now that's a lovely poem there, but in reality, there is a point that our own cup overflows and we need to protect ourselves. And part of that is leaning on other professionals to be able to support us when there might be disclosures or there might be situations in which the safety of young people is in our hands. Take the time now to watch this story. It's Julie's story. And then I want you to make a note of what you would do. Pause the video now and check it out on YouTube. Welcome back team. The next video I want to watch is about why you would work with other professionals. This gentleman is going to have a conversation with 
other young teachers and trainee teachers that are in a similar position to you. Again, if you struggle to access the video, have a look down here at the link. Pause and watch the video now. Welcome back team. So it's well worth having a reflection on what you perhaps thought about the comments that were made in this video. Do you think that the comments were correct? Do they sit in line with your expectations? And what further research can you do? By the way, this particular video could support part of your research log. So what now? I've given you how to research a research log and you've had a couple of key legislations that I would expect to see in your final piece of work under the titled questions that I've given you. Now it's time to start that research. Good luck. Any questions, let me know.